Hi, I'm Mark Matson. I'm chief of the Laboratory of Neurosciences at the National Institute on Aging, and also I'm on the faculty at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Today I'm going to talk about how bioenergetic challenges, namely intermittent uh, energy restriction or intermittent fasting and exercise, impact the body and brain in the context of aging and Parkinson's disease with implications for risk reduction as we grow old and also possibly therapeutic interventions in PD patients. Now there's a, a evolutionary context to what I'm gonna talk about and that is that we evolved as did other animals and environments where food was relatively scarce and we had to work to acquire the food. And so uh, our ancestors uh, prior to the agricultural revolution uh, often went extended periods without food and individuals whose brains and bodies function well, perhaps optimally in that uh, fasted state had a survival advantage and indeed even the higher cognitive functions of humans, things like creativity and imagination, uh, initially evolved uh, for the purpose of, for example, inventing tools to acquire and process food. And even things like imagination uh, evolved initially uh, in the context of food uh, acquisition. Uh, unfortunately, in modern day societies, many people are overeating and sedentary. So this slide shows uh, three different eating patterns. The upper one is the typical American eating pattern and what's shown is blood glucose levels and blood ketone levels throughout a two day period. Uh, and what you see is every time the person eats, the glucose levels go up and then they come back down, lunch, dinner, late night snack, Ketones never go up because every time the person eats, they replenish the glycogen stores in the liver, uh, and that energy supply is always tapped into first. The ketones come from fats in your fat cells, and so these are never tapped to, into in people who eat the typical American eating pattern, unless they exercise uh, considerably. This middle example is someone who fasted for one day and then ate three meals the next day. And what you can see is on the fasting day, after about 10 to 12 hours, the ketones start to rise, they keep going up so that this person is now using fats uh, as an energy source. And ketones then provide the fuel for our muscles and also our nerve cells in our brain, which is what I'm gonna focus on today. This bottom example is someone who every day they don't eat breakfast or lunch, then they eat all their food within a six hour time window. And so what they're happening with them is they're getting a metabolic switch that occurs uh, after about 10 to 12 hours uh, not eating, so in the morning hours. And, and so they're getting the metabolic switch. Now, We've done a lot of work in animals and some in human subjects that that looked at the effects of these intermittent, uh, what we call intermittent fasting type diets on various health indicators. And the bottom line is that the intermittent fasting will reduce inflammation in various organs and, and reduce markers of inflammation in the blood. Um, also, the ketones that are elevated uh, not only provide fuel for brain cells, but we're finding they stimulate the production of neurotrophic factors, one of which I'll talk about brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. We also find that in animals, and, and we're now testing this in humans, that intermittent fasting can increase the resistance of neurons in the brain to stress. And we, we've published uh, extensively review articles on this topic. So here's an example from a small study we did in asthma patients, where we put them on a diet where every other day they eat only 500 calories. And on that diet, uh, 
they're getting elevation in ketones on or the calorie restricted days, the days they're only eating 500 calories, because that's not enough to keep the glycogen liver stores uh, full. And so uh, fats are mobilized and ketones go up on the fasting days. And then on the feeding days, the ketones are back down. So there's this every other day metabolic switching between using carbohydrates on the feeding day and using ketones on the fasting day. What we found in the asthma patients is within a few weeks of adaptation to this alternate day fasting regimen, the person's mood and energy increase. And they're not shown here, they're also losing body weight. And this is a two month study and they lost on average about eight to 10% of their initial body weight. These people were overweight or obese. We also found that, uh, well, there was an initial increase in hunger score for the first two weeks to a month. Then thereafter, the hunger on these uh, 500 calorie days decreased back to uh, pre-intermittent fasting uh, levels. Then we looked at the um, asthma scores, which greatly improved. So this is a asthma symptoms improved and we measured airway resistance that improved. We took blood and measured markers of inflammation, tumor necrosis factor, which not immediately by, by about two weeks and then definitely by a month, there was a dramatic reduction in inflammation. Uh, we've done other studies with what's now called the 5-2 diets, which is essentially two days a week eating only 500 calories, the other five days eating normally. So two days we're causing this metabolic switch and that improves a lot of health indicators and risk factors for cardiovascular disease, diabetes. And then finally, we're doing an ongoing study of intermittent fasting in subjects at risk for cognitive impairment because of their age and metabolic status. And we're asking the question whether in this population of subjects who are at risk for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, whether there's beneficial effects on Function, brain function, and we're also looking at neural network activity by functional MRI. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about some animal studies we've done in animal models that are relevant to Parkinson's disease and ask the question whether alternate day fasting in animals, either uh, 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 in, initially in mice, and then we also did some studies in monkeys with uh, this short-term daily fasting. So we use the MPTP model, uh, which was, this is a chemical discovered by Bill Langston and shown to selectively damage and kill dopaminergic neurons through this mechanism. Essentially, this chemical impairs the mitochondrial function in the dopaminergic neurons, and then they die. So we found that both in mice and rhesus monkeys, uh, if we maintain them on either an every other day intermittent fasting diet in the case of the mice or daily uh, short-term fasting in the case of the monkeys, the functional outcome, uh, that is t motor function of the mice or monkeys is significantly better in the animals that have been maintained on these short intermittent metabolic switching diets. And we also looked at the brains and there was preservation of dopaminergic neurons with intermittent fasting in the mice. And, uh, and we also found that uh, BDNF levels, brain derived neurotrophic factor levels were sustained at higher levels in the uh, striatum of the monkeys exposed to MPTP if they've been on daily uh, metabolic switching or daily major calorie restriction. Similarly, uh, GDNF, glial cell derived neurotrophic factor levels were maintained at higher levels on the animals on the intermittent metabolic switching. Uh, and both of these neurotrophic factors, GDNF and BDNF, have been shown to protect dopaminergic neurons in various animal models of Parkinson's disease. Okay, 
So I want to quickly go through some of the metabolic changes that occur with fasting and also with extended aerobic exercise. So when glycogen stores in the liver are depleted, then fats are mobilized from the adipocytes, the fat cells. The free fatty acids are released into the blood. They go into the liver and they're converted to ketones. The two major ketones are beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. These then uh, are released into the blood. They're transported into the brain, into neurons throughout the brain, and the ketones can be used to generate ATP or energy for the neurons. And so ketones bolster neuronal bioenergetics and can protect neurons against conditions that we think are occurring in Parkinson's disease. Interestingly, uh, my lab and a lab up at uh, New York University found that this ketone, BHB, also induces the expression of BDNF, which as I mentioned, uh, is beneficial for neurons in various ways that increase their resistance to stress and sustain uh, and enhance their functionality. This is just an example showing, uh, essentially looking at whether mice are using carbohydrates uh, or fats uh, when they're on these intermittent fasting diets. And so this is alternate day fasting and on this is respiratory exchange ratio, which a low RER means the animals are using fats. High RER means they're using carbohydrates. So in the animals in the fasting groups, they're using fats on the fasting days, but then carbohydrates on the feeding days. And indeed, when we measure the blood ketone levels, they're up on the fasting days and down on the feeding days. In this study, we also had a combination of daily treadmill exercise with fasting and and those group of mice had the highest ketone levels uh, uh, on the you know when they're combining exercise with fasting so the point there is you can enhance the effects of fasting on uh, upregulating ketones and and bdnf we think in the brain by combining having exercise during the fasting period. Uh, this slide just simply shows that this ketone beta-hydroxybutyrate increases BDNF levels in the brains of uh, animals. And actually this is in cultured neurons, so directly exposing the neurons to the ketone increases BDNF levels. And then this study down here uh, in vivo, infusion of BDNF, uh, the ketone into the brain increases BDNF levels. So the idea here is that fasting, and particularly if it's combined with exercise, increase ketone levels. The ketones then stimulate the production of BDNF, which increases the resistance of neurons to stress. Um, interestingly, we, we've done some experiments where we essentially feed animals, uh, the ketone, BHB, and initially we used a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease and found that this ketone uh, dietary supplementation will uh, reverse the behavioral deficits, both anxiety-like phenotype and learning and memory in these Alzheimer's mice. And on Parkinson's disease, there's emerging evidence that the first neurons that are affected are not the dopaminergic neurons. And in fact, neurons in the brain stem that control the autonomic nervous system through the vagus nerve seem to be affected before the dopaminergic neurons. And now there's a lot of interest in the possibility that these uh, peripheral nerve uh, alterations may uh, lead in a retrograde manner to degeneration of the dopaminergic neurons through propagation of pathology, alpha-synuclein pathology, which I'll talk about. We've done some studies uh, looking at how intermittent fasting impacts function of the autonomic nervous system, and particularly the vagus nerve, which uses acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter. So the vagus nerve uh, innervates the heart, 
its activity in the vagus nerve will slow heart rate, reduce blood pressure, and and actually protect the neuro the cardiac cells against stress. Also, the vagus nerve innervates the gut uh, and controls motility of the gut. So activation of the vagus nerve, the parasympathetic nervous system, will enhance gut motility. Turns out that Parkinson's patients, often in their clinical history, it will be found that they have a chronic constipation, which is consistent with impaired function of the vagus nerve. Also, many Parkinson's patients have altered heart rate regulation. So we did some studies in alpha-synuclein mutant mice. As many of you may know, uh, there are some families that have mutations in alpha-synuclein gene or duplication of the alpha-synuclein gene. And these individuals, as they age, they develop robust aggregation of alpha-synuclein in neurons and ultimately leading to degeneration of dopaminergic neurons and Parkinson's disease. And so we took these mice which develop age-related motor dysfunction, and we put them on either alternate day fasting diet, which is the red here. We had uh, both normal and Parkinson's mice, and we measured their heart rate. Uh, and what we found is that uh, first of all, the dashed lines is the Parkinson's mice, the solid lines is the normal mice. So the Parkinson's mice have elevated resting heart rate. And then over time, as we adapt them to the intermittent fasting diet, their heart rate goes down, as we expected from previous studies we've done. And we also had group in the groups in the blue that we put on a McDonald's diet or a high fat sugar diet. and that diet exacerbated the effects of the Parkinson's disease on control of heart rate. So those animals uh, uh, on the high fat, high sugar diet had the highest heart rate. And also the intermittent fasting delayed the onset of the motor dysfunction and the high fat sugar diet accelerated the onset of the motor dysfunction. Okay, this just shows in this case in, in normal rats that either alternate day fasting or daily fasting reduce resting heart rate. Uh, however, when you then put the animals back on ad libitum daily food intake, the heart rate within a few weeks goes back to where it was before. So this isn't a, a, a permanent beneficial effect on the heart. It has to be maintained, the intermittent fasting. We showed that the reason that the intermittent fasting slows heart rate is through a BDNF-mediated mechanism in the brain stem. Essentially, uh, the intermittent fasting increases BDNF levels, and the BDNF is required for the slowing of heart rate because when we take mice that have reduced levels of BDNF, the, there's increased uh, uh, activity of the parasympathetic neurons. So here's the model here. Uh, intermittent fasting, intermittent energy restriction exercise, increased BDNF levels, that increases activity in the parasympathetic neurons that innervate the heart. They release more acetylcholine, it slows heart rate. And, and we've also shown in some published studies that the intermittent fasting through this mechanism protects the heart against stress in various stress tests we did on the animals. Okay, now I mentioned the gut and that the vagus nerve from the brain stem uh, innervates the gut and will increase gut motility and, and protect against constipation and also protect against inflammation, chronic inflammation of the gut. Now, there are studies done re very recently in these alpha-synuclein mutant mice I mentioned that develop, ultimately develop uh, dopamine neuron degeneration and motor dysfunction. And in this study, what they did is they, they surgically cut uh, the vagus nerve on one side, uh, uh, but not the other. And then they looked at these neurons in the 
brainstem that send their axons to the um, gut. And what they found is uh, when they subject these uh, animals to a toxin rodenone, which is similar to MPTP in, in the way it works, that there's a increased alpha-synuclein accumulation in these brain stem neurons that control gut motility. However, when they cut the vagus nerve uh, and then expose the animals to the same neurotoxin, uh, then they do not see the pathology in the brain stem. So the bottom line is that uh, uh, the, there's a bit a retrograde transmission of alpha synuclein pathology from the gut up into the brain. Now we've done some studies, and this is unpublished, and it's done by Yuki Kishimoto, a postdoc in my lab, where we we took the alpha synuclein mutant mice and we induced chronic mild gut inflammation. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the details how we do that. Essentially, we uh, put in the drinking water a chemical that, uh, with the dose we use, causes mild gut inflammation. And uh, so we did this in both wild-type mice and Parkinson's mice, alpha-synuclein mutant mice. So the DSS designates the gut inflammation. And what we found is initially with a, there's like a transient uh, uh, lack of gain of body weight in the animals that we cause gut inflammation, then they gain weight at a fairly normal rate. And what we found is there's a transient increase in leakiness of the gut during the first four weeks, uh, and then that resolves, and there's kind of a chronic low-level gut inflammation, which I'll show you the data from analyzing the tissue. Then we looked at, uh, we followed these mice uh, during the time course where they would develop motor dysfunction, and we found that the Parkinson's mice with chronic mild gut inflammation uh, showed decline in motor function much sooner than the Parkinson's mice without gut inflammation. So there's an acceleration of the onset of the motor dysfunction when we induce mild gut inflammation. And we also uh, looked at grip strength, another measure, and stride length, another measure. And the bottom line is the gut inflammation exacerbates the disease process in this mouse model of Parkinson's disease. Then we looked at alpha-synuclein pathology in the gut, shown here. So the dark staining is alpha-synuclein accumulation in neurons in the gut. Uh, uh, and then these are neurons that connect with the vagus nerve neurons. And then we found that the chronic gut inflammation also exacerbates the alpha-synuclein pathology in the brain. Uh, and that's quantified here. And then we looked at dopaminergic neurons, and we found that uh, the when we induce gut inflammation, there's uh, fewer dopamine neur neurons surviving, and that's these small dots are the dopaminergic neurons. So in the Parkinson's mice, there's fewer surviving dopaminergic neurons, and there's uh, much fewer surviving dopaminergic neurons if we induce gut inflammation in the Parkinson's mice. And then finally, for this study, we measured various inflammatory cytokines, tumor necrosis factor, alpha, which I mentioned we found was reduced by intermittent fasting in the asthma patients. Um, we found the bottom line is that when we induce gut inflammation, there's in the Parkinson's mice, there's an increase in inflammation in the brain. And we think this is being transmitted through the vagus nerve because we did not see uh, this uh, effect of gut inflammation on circulating markers of inflammation. Okay, so anyway, uh, in the brain in Parkinson's, there's neuroinflammation that occurs, uh, oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, we think that's involved ultimately in the degeneration of the dopaminergic neurons, but it's also involved in degeneration of the brainstem neurons that innervate the heart and the gut. And so trying to understand what's going on in the gut with aging 
and how that might be modified by uh, uh, diet and lifestyle factors is very important. I didn't talk about the gut microbiota, the bacteria in the gut, but that's an active area. So the evidence is emerging that intermittent fasting and exercise which cause intermittent metabolic switching will reduce inflammation, oxidative stress, and enhance the clearance of alpha-synuclein through a process called autophagy. So these diet and lifestyle factors may not only improve overall health, but may protect against PD. We don't know about treating PD patients, but there's now some funding available uh, to um, test intermittent fasting in PD patients, and so stay tuned on that. This is my last slide. Uh, so the idea here is that diet and lifestyles that include intermittent energy restriction and aerobic exercise will activate, uh, affect neurons in ways that protect them against stress and enhance their functionality. And we've worked out at least in rodents what's going on uh, in nerve cells that account for the increased resistance to stress and increased resistance to neurodegenerative uh, disorders, at least in animal models. And then on the other hand, um, we think it's the switching is important. The eating after fasting, resting and sleeping after exercise, because uh, we find that uh, the resting, sleeping and eating uh, actually that's when your nerve cells grow and form new synapses. So the switching back and forth between metabolic challenge, bioenergetic challenge, fasting and exercise, and then recovery period uh, may optimize health. And this slide uh, shows my lab a few years ago. Um, Ruchin Wan uh, is the key person in all the work we did looking at uh, parasympathetic innervation of the heart in various models. <clears throat> um, other people here, uh, Yong Lu was involved in, uh, in quite a bit of the work with intermittent fasting. And uh, we practice what we preach. This is a, my running group a couple years ago, uh, getting these young scientists get, getting BDNF levels up in their brain so that they perform well in the lab. And thank you very much.